Colossians chapter 2. You hate it when the button in your inside pockets buttons close. You know? okay. There we go. There we go. And let's start with a word of prayer, and we'll hop right in this evening. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today, and thank you for the folks being here this evening. Thank you so much for your word, and uh, just the truth that it contains and applies just to every situation. We thank you for that, and I pray it helps all to listen and uh, gain something tonight. Help me as I teach to say the right things and to not say what you have me not to. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Anyway, we've been studying the uh, uh, seven churches of Revelations the last couple of weeks, and uh, of course we started off with uh, the church at Ephesus. And uh, the church at Ephesus was a church that uh, had lost uh, their priority. And, of course, they'd left their first love. Uh, I talked about, of course, Jesus came to them and as the prioritized one. Of course, he was the one who held the seven candlesticks and the one who was, uh, stood in the, in the center of the candlesticks. And he was the priority one, and this church was doing everything else right. Uh, but they had left that priority. They left that first love. And then we went to uh, the church in, um, who remembers, Smyrna. And uh, Al's been to Smyrna. So, anyway, it's a very big city now of almost 4 million people, but of course Christ came to this church as the preserving one, and this church was going through much trouble, much difficulty, and in the letter they received, God was preparing them for even worse trouble that was coming, and we don't see any ill of this church, just the hard time they're going through, uh, but how Christ can help them persevere, help them get to it. And then we had the church of Pergamos uh, that we ended with last week. And this was a church that uh, had a doctrinal problem. Of course, they were letting in the doctrines of Balaam and the Nicolaitans, doctrines of uh, compromise and corruption and conceit. And, of course, uh, Jesus was not pleased with that. And as the powerful one, he said, if you don't change this, I'm going to come and fight against you, which obviously you don't want to fight against God. That's a very bad situation to be. And today, though, we're going to pick up with the church of Thyatira. If I can have my map there one more time, Jake. And uh, so we're working our way around here in a semicircle. Starts with Ephesus, goes up to Smyrna, Pergamos. Now we're working our way down the loop to Thyatira over there. And see so if you get even the pointer going there. Good job, Jake. Thanks. And uh, but anyway, uh, just so you can kind of picture all that. Of course, they're in, the, in Turkey, the region of Asia. It was a region of the Roman Empire. It's just kind of on the, the west side of Turkey. It's not necessarily talking about the continent of Asia, but this region of Asia uh, in Turkey. And so we'll pick up here in Revelations 2, uh, verse 18. And it says here, And unto the angel of the church of Th in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. And we have this church in Thyatira. And Thyatira, of these seven cities, was the smallest and youngest of the seven cities. And probably the least important of the seven cities, you know, politically, financially, wasn't like a necessarily a big metropolitan city. Uh, but a matter of fact, when it was originally built uh, several hundred years before this, it was a, simply a military garrison. Uh, the king of Pergamos uh, is the one who built up this city, this little fort, and it's kind of down in the valley. There's no hills, no mountains around. There's no great places to fortify. Uh, but he put this military garrison in this valley and called it Thyatira, and it was kind of a roadblock. Uh, because if any kings from the east were coming to invade Pergamos, they'd have to go through this valley. And so he stuck Thyatira right in the middle to slow him down so he'd have time to prepare and to uh, gather his forces and prepare for a big conflict. And so as a result of that, Thyatira uh, was constantly getting conquered. You know, somebody would be attacking Pergamos and conquer Thyatira. Then uh, Pergamos would win the battle. They'd come back and conquer it back. And lots of back and forth. So really kind of a, a tumultuous uh, life that this city had uh, until finally the Romans came and conquered the whole region, and a peace came to the, to the area. Of course, it no longer needed a military garrison because there were no, no longer armies traveling to and fro through this, this region, and it became a, a more of an industrial city. And uh, the city uh, became a, a lot of the history and the, the artifacts they dig up. This, we'd find this city was full of uh, trade guilds or unions, as we'd call them today. And uh, they were famous for their uh, purple dye. They had a dyer's union uh, for uh, dyeing fabric. And they had uh, all sorts of different unions. They had wool workers, uh, 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 trade guilds, linen workers, uh, makers of garments, trade guilds, dyer's guilds, uh, leather workers guilds, tanner's guilds, potter's guilds, baker's guilds, bronzemith's guilds. So this was just your typical blue-collar union city. That's what we have in Thyatira. It wasn't anything massive, uh, but it was uh, very industrious. It didn't have necessarily a lot of wealth, but it, it produced a lot of things. And it was a very productive town. And in this city, we, of course, we find a church. And uh, the first mention of Thyatira in the Bible uh, is in Acts 16. 
Paul is in Philippi, and he meets a lady uh, who sells purple named Lydia. Of course, she's from Thyatira because they produce a lot of purple dye and purple fabric. And uh, so he meets uh, Lydia. Of course, she gets saved and baptized. Her family gets saved there in uh, Philippi. And uh, yeah, most people presume is that at some point she went back and helped to start this church uh, in Thyatira, or possibly Paul did in uh, Acts chapter 19 there. Uh, but this church uh, began to grow and, and to thrive. And we see some very good stuff about this church to start off with. And in verse 18, of course, we already read it, but it says, Unto the church uh, of the angel in Thyatira write these things, uh, saith the Son of God, whose eyes, uh, who hath eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. And we see God uh, compare, uh, describing himself as the pure one, the purified one. Of course, the flames of fire, the fire purifies, and the feet of fine brass, perfect. There's nothing wrong with him. There's no impurities in him because uh, Christ is perfect. He is the pure uh, one. And uh, through scripture, when things are uh, related to God, it's always pure. Of course, when God was telling the Israelites to build the tabernacle, uh, all the materials they're getting together in the wilderness had to be pure. They needed pure gold. They needed pure oil. They needed pure myrrh, pure frankincense, pure candlesticks, pure incense, and pure tables. Everything had to be pure because this was a representation of God on earth, and God is pure. Pure. There's nothing uh, impure, nothing, no defect in them whatsoever. Psalms 12, 6 tells us the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of fire purified seven times. And in uh, 1 Timothy uh, 5, uh, 22, God tells, tells us to keep thyself pure. And uh, pureness and purity is very important to Christ, as we'll see here in a moment with this church. But in verse 19, uh, we see uh, lots of good stuff about this church. It says here, it starts off, I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. And so we have here an exemplary church. There are works. It's mentioned twice. It starts, I know thy works, and then again, I, and thy works. And this was obviously a hardworking, a faithful, a diligent church. God mentioned their works twice in the same sentence. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And, uh, but they are a busy, faithful church, uh, diligent about uh, serving and helping others. We see here, it says, I know thy charity. And that's the word agape in the Bible, which, of course, means unconditional love. And this was a loving church, a church that loved others, loved people, uh, loved serving people. And it says, and thy service. Because of their love, it brought out fruits of service. And they were a loving God, serving God, loving each other, serving each other. And this was a very faithful, a very, very impressive church here. It says here, and then it says, I know thy faith. It was a church of faith that stood strong, thy patience. They endured things and kept on going, didn't fall back. And I love what it says here, and the last to be more than the first. Of course, think of the church of Ephesus. What did they do? They left their first love. Uh, but this church, the last, is better. The most recent stuff they are doing is more impressive than the first stuff they're doing. They are growing in grace. They are growing in service to the Lord. They are growing in faith. And this church is moving forward uh, and doing some amazing things. A church filled with love, filled with faith, patience, service, works, uh, getting better and better, last better than the first. And you think with this church, man, everything is going well. And then in verse 20, we see this word, notwithstanding. That's always one of those words, you know, you you know, you, you do something dumb, and you know, it's like and you try to do a bunch of nice stuff for your wife, you know, to make her feel better, but it's like it doesn't really make up for this dumb thing you did. You know, you kind of have to apologize or fix that first. And, uh, but what's God saying in this church? You're doing a lot of great things. Notwithstanding, there's still there's a, there's a problem here. There's an elephant in the room that we need to deal with first uh, before we can really enjoy all this good stuff. And we see in verse 20 uh, that God gets to the, the problem or the issue with this church, and it's an issue of purity. It says, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants uh, to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Man, wow, yeah, this church is going really good. All of a sudden you get verse 20, it's like, whoa, this is terrible. And uh, of course, we have notwithstanding, this church, uh, while they were doing many good things, they, they, they had something going on that was a serious problem. We have this word here, uh, because thou sufferest. The word sufferest, it means to allow, to permit, uh, to let, to allow one to do as he wishes, not to restrain, to let alone. And this church was allowing something it shouldn't be allowing. It's suffering something, putting up with something it shouldn't be. Of course, as Christians, there are many things we are supposed to put up with and endure. Second Timothy says, thou therefore endure hardness 
as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. We're supposed to endure hardness. We're supposed to put up with that, suffer that. It says here, but uh, watch thou in all things endure afflictions. And we're supposed to endure afflictions. When hard things come, when troubles come into our lives, that doesn't mean to quit, to get upset, to get worked up. No, it means we're supposed to endure those things. We're supposed to suffer those things. Uh, Hebrews 12, 7. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as sons. And correction, correction from the Lord is something we're supposed to endure. We're supposed to suffer, put up with. It's not something we're supposed to push away from. This is a good thing. We need this in our lives. And uh, in 1 Peter 2, uh, God says, uh, If a man uh, for conscience toward God endure grief, uh, suffering long, wrongfully. Grief and uh, wrongful uh, suffering is something that we all have to endure in life. Uh, but this church was enduring something they weren't supposed to be enduring. They were suffering, putting up with something that God did not want them uh, to endure. And the Christians of Thyatira had, uh, I got this quote from a, a book, it says here uh, by Marshall Neal, it says, the Christians of Thyatira had love, but they were so sweet and pleasant that they tolerated everything including Jezebel and her teaching. And this church ended up tolerating putting up with stuff they shouldn't have put up with. And uh, this Jezebel here, of course, uh, many uh, don't actually believe this was a person named Jezebel. It was possibly a, a lady referred to as Jezebel or maybe a group of people that God was referring to the Jezebel of the Old Testament to describe uh, their behavior and describe their, uh, way, of their uh, way of living. And of course, Jezebel, we all know that name. We're, of course, we're doing J names with our kids and girl names. You know, that's the one we're going to stay away from. No, J, Jezebel, Bible name for our family. It just doesn't, it's not a name you like. This is a bad name because Jezebel has a very bad reputation in the Bible. Of course, Ahab's wife in uh, 1 Kings 16. This was a lady uh, that uh, was the uh, daughter of a Phoenician king, and she came in, and uh, she brought uh, persecution to God's uh, prophets into the land of Israel, and she brought this worship of Baal, an idolatrous, immoral religion that involved all sorts of immorality and wickedness along with it, and she brought this into the land. And uh, this uh, Jezebel was drawing others in this church to immorality and idolatry. Uh, and she was pushing uh, people, she was uh, condoning bad living and uh, wickedness and uh, fornication, the Bible tells us here, and eating things offered to idols. And uh, no doubt in Thyatira, uh, there was a lot of draw for immorality, a lot of draw towards idolatry. Of course, these big trade guilds, these unions that were uh, very powerful in Thyatira, uh, much like today, unions, there's dues, there's some requirements to be part of a union, and there were some pretty strict requirements to be part of these trade guilds. A lot of them required you to be uh, participate in these uh, pagan festivals at these pagan temples and uh, to get involved in uh, eating uh, sacrifices offered to idols and get involved in the immorality of these festivals. And there was a lot of pull in this city to do wickedness. And that, sit, that pull had crept into the church as this lady, this Jezebel, was pulling, or this group of people, whoever it may be, was pulling folks uh, to immorality and to idolatry, to get involved in these festivals. And it was a very wicked thing that was going on. And any philosophy that makes it easier to sin is of the devil, whether it come from a worldly source or one we feel is right or spiritual. And this was a lady who, or a group of people, whatever it may be, that got into the church and was promoting, uh, uh, promoting wickedness, idolatry, and immorality in the church. I mean, this seems absurd. Uh, it's such a good church, but they're allowing this to go on. It's like, man, how could a church that with all this great stuff in 19 allow this to go on? But it did. And uh, another quote from uh, Marshall Neal, he said, good works uh, do not justify false teaching. Many today would excuse a man for his errors in doctrine and practice because he is doing so much good, but the good only makes his teaching more dangerous. And I suppose this, whoever this Jezebel represented was probably someone faithful to the church, probably someone very involved, maybe a, a, a Sunday school teacher, maybe a good, a good worker, maybe uh, somebody who uh, helped, or maybe somebody on staff, whoever it was. But this was obviously a significant, important person in the church. And so they were tolerating this. And uh, when Christ uh, sees this, he's like, boy, this is a problem. And we see a church here uh, that had, had compromised on purity. They were doing all the good things, but they allowed this immorality and idolatry. They suffered it and put up with it in the church. It just seems absolutely absurd. And doing good uh, does not ne neglect a compromised living. And God calls all of us to live a life of purity. And purity is so important. It is uh, so valuable. And it does so many wonderful things. And the devil is constantly attacking purity. Of course, our, our, we live in a very sensual, very immoral society. And it was no, no better back then. I'm sure it was yeah, very, very wicked. And, uh, but God wants us to stand against that and to live pure lives. And we see in James uh, 1.27... Uh, a very, uh, very good, well-known verse. It says, Pure religion 
and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. Of course, this was a church that was doing those things. They were visiting the fatherless. I'm sure they had chariot routes, getting kids in church, and they were taking care of people. The widows in the area who were suffering and in need, they were busy, they were serving, they had that unconditional love. It didn't matter if these people were rich or could do anything back to them. They were there to serve them. They were doing these good things. And that is part of the pure religion, but they missed the other half. It says, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. And this was a church that allowed themselves to get spotted by the world. They allowed impurity to get in the church. And uh, while so much good was happening, they, they just, I assume they just t- said, you know, it's good, you know, why, why mess up a good thing? And they allowed this, this impurity to grow in the church. And in Revelations 21, we see God's response to this. And verse 21, it says, 221, it says, uh, Jesus is speaking, he says, And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. And we see here, I find this verse actually encouraging. We see the patience of the pure one, the patience of God. He, this, I mean, whatever the wickedness was going on in this church, God says, you know what, I'm going to give time for repentance. You know, turn back to me. Let's, let's, let's deal with this. Let's get this solved. And Ezekiel 33, 11 says, Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? And God is always willing for us to turn back to him when we get away, when we make a mistake, when we fail. God wants us to come back. God wanted this person, this Jezebel, to come back to him. Uh, But sadly, she did not. And we see here in uh, verse, or at least not at this point, in verse 22, it says, Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except uh, they repent of their deeds. And there's always judgment for immorality, for impurity. Of course, uh, the Bible tells us about the, the danger of impurity. Um, I thought I had the verse, maybe I didn't write it down. Uh, but in uh, 2 Peter, of course, Talk, get, tells about how God is, again, he's pushing these people to repent, to turn back to him. Uh, of course, the Lord says, uh, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some man count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. And there is, there is judgment. God is patient. God is uh, long-suffering to us, word, but eventually there is consequences when we keep ignoring his calls to turn to him and ignoring his calls to turn to him. And God was warning this church to, hey, wake up. Stop, stop, stop this right now. Quick, turn back, because there's going to be some great wrath coming if you don't stop this. And uh, great uh, damage and great hurt that comes. And, of course, he says uh, with a, there'll be great tribulation for these people. And verse 23, it gets even worse. It says, and I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to his works. And we see here the consequences of just letting sin go on and on. The consequences of not saying, no, that's enough. Not saying, no, that's too far. We're going to turn back. That's enough. We're ending it here. And we see here how it gets worse. And now it's not only destroying her. It's not only destroying those who are involved in it with her. Now it's affecting the children and her children and the next generation and those following after. And uh, if we allow sin to grow and to dwell in our lives, the longer it's there, the more it gets its roots and the more people it's going to hurt. The more damage it's going to do to us, the more damage it's going to hurt those around us, the more damage it's going to hurt our kids and the next generation. We see here a great trouble, great damage coming on its way to this church if they do not stop and deal with this issue of purity in the church. Proverbs 7, of course, this, uh, the proverb of the adulterous woman, and it says, Hearken now unto me, therefore, O ye children, and attend to my words. Let not thine heart uh, decline to go to, to or decline to her ways. Go not astray in her paths, for she has cast down many wounded. Yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. And when God addresses immorality, it is not a pleasant thing. And unfortunately, uh, this church was just suffering it. They were putting up with it, which is just, it is, it's mind-boggling, because in verse 19, this church is amazing, uh, but yet they're allowing this to go on, and they're not addressing it, and it's growing. It's affecting more people, and pretty soon judgment was coming if they don't turn back. Then we see in verse 24, it says, But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not 
uh, this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as, uh, they, as they speak, I will put upon you uh, none other burden. Of course, there are still those in this church who are standing, who are being pure, who are fleeing fornication, as uh, 1 Corinthians 6 tells us. And uh, God says, I'm not putting any greater burden. Keep doing what you're doing. Just keep staying away from this. And it reminds me of the passage of Acts, in Acts 15 where the, uh, the, people, the heads and haunches of the church, their apostles were all gathering together in Jerusalem, kind of having a council for all these new Gentiles coming into the church. And uh, they came to this conclusion. It says, For it seemed uh, good to the Holy Ghost and to us uh, to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornications, uh, from which if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well. Uh, fare ye well. We see here the importance of purity, the importance of purity from idolatry and from immorality. And uh, uh, verse 25, it says, But that which ye have already hold fast till I come. He says, Keep doing those good things, that service, that love you have, uh, those works that you have that are good, your patience, your faith, keep doing those. Uh, but make this purity a priority in your church. Make this purity a priority in your life. Uh, because what, without it, uh, there's, <laughs> you've got some really bad stuff uh, coming your way. And verse 26, he says, To him that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, uh, to him I will give power over the nations. And we see here the power of overcoming, the power of purity. Purity brings power. And there is power that a pure and separated life has, a power to impact others. Verse 27, he says, And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter shall uh, they be broken to shivers uh, even as I received of my father. And we see here they're going to rule with him. There's authority to overcoming. There's authority that comes with purity. And a life uh, uh, that is pure and separated has uh, an authority to lead others. And it says, uh, verse 28, and I will give him the morning star. And we see the gift of purity. And there is a gift that a pure and separated life has. Of course, the morning star is a Christ is the morning star. And uh, we see here um, a gift of closeness with Christ. And purity, that pure conscience, uh, helps give the closeness to Christ. It helps our relationship grow closer to Christ. And uh, Matthew 5, 8, Jesus says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And of course, verse 29, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And again, as all of these ends, boy, if you have an ear, hear. This isn't just for Thyatira, this is for everybody. And this is something we can apply to all of our lives. And so what does this mean for you, uh, for you, for me? Uh, what are we suffering or putting up with in our life that we shouldn't be? Is there something in your life, something in my life that we are putting up with, we're allowing to hang around, or we know it shouldn't be there, but you know we're doing a bunch of good things others, so maybe we can just let this thing get past. Like God says, no, 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 let's not leave any elephants sit in the room. Let's get it all dealt with, and let's move forward uh, past this thing. And uh, moral and doctrinal purity are non-negotiable in the Christian life and in the church. And we see, uh, thirdly, the responsibility of purity begins with us. And uh, 1 John 3, 2 says, uh, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but when we know that, when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope that we're going to be like Christ someday, we're going to get new bodies, we're going to be glorified, we're going to be like him, everyone that has this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. And God calls us all to a life of purity, to purifying ourselves, to keeping our lives pure. We find those things that are sticking out that are contrary to God's word. It may not be some great immorality. Maybe it's a small thing, but we can all strive uh, to make sure our lives are pure and impurities are not getting into our lives. And so that's the church of Thyatira. So now we're going to go in chapter 3, the message to the church in Sardis. And uh, so number, verse number 1 of chapter 3, we'll start there. And uh, Jesus continues, and he says, Unto the church of, uh, the, of Sardis, in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. So we see here God, he is the possessing one. He, he has this church as they are his, they belong to him. The stars, the spirits of God, they are his. And, and then he has this letter to Sardis. And uh, Sardis is a very interesting story. There's lots of cool stories about uh, Sardis you can read. Uh, but Sardis was a very old city, uh, dating back 1,200 years before Christ. And it was the capital of the ancient kingdom of Lydia. 
and uh, they, they, he fought a lot with Pergamos back in the day. Uh, but it was located about 50 miles east of Smyrna, and it was uh, the main part of the city, lay in a valley uh, this is at the convergence of two rivers, and it had a big old fortress uh, near Mount um, Mullus. Tumulus. It's T-M-O-L-U-S. I don't know if that T is silent or how you say that. Tumulus. Uh, but anyway, it had a mountain with a really cool fortress on it. And uh, so this is kind of a cooler city than Thyatira, just from a, a structural standpoint. And uh, this city uh, is thought to be the first city in the world to mint coins. And uh, that's kind of cool. It was conquered by everybody. King Cyrus of the Persians conquered this. Alexander the Great and the Greeks conquered this. Uh, Antiochus III and the Syrians conquered this. And uh, Hannibal, actually, after he lost to the Romans in the Punic Wars, he fled uh, to this city and he convinced Antiochus to go to battle against the Romans for him. And then, of course, the Romans conquered it. So this city has been uh, conquered a lot. So I picked a lot of bad sides and battles. But under the Romans, uh, Sardis uh, became a very great center of trade and commerce, and of course it had this massive fortress, and it had uh, several different trade routes that were coming through, and so you just think of a massive old city with big castle and just roads going out in every direction, and that was Sardis. It was a metropolitan, it was a melting pot, there was many different languages spoken in, in, in the Sardis, and uh, so it was a very cosmopolitan city, very famous place at the time. And in Acts 19, we assume that when the church was started, when uh, it says here that uh, all of Asia heard the word of God, well, the Apostle Paul was at Ephesus for two years, and we assume at this time a church was started. And in uh, chapter 3, verse 1, Christ has a message for this church. And he says, Unto uh, the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven stars, or hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, he has them, they belong to him, he is the possessing one. He says, I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest, and art dead. So that's kind of a rough start. It's just a dead church right there. Pretty, pretty simple there. Uh, but this church, it says here, they had a name uh, that thou livest. They had a lively name. This church had a good reputation, but they were dead. And we'll turn the page here. And uh, this church, uh, they were known, uh, obviously, this name, this reputation. They were well known in their city, in their region, among cr the Christian circles of the day. Uh, everyone knew of this church of, of uh, Sardis. They had a great name, that they were alive, that they were exciting, uh, that they had stuff going on. This was a cool place to be. This was a fun, exciting place to be. They had the best of everything going on. I'm sure as people traveled through, they wanted to visit the church of Sardis. This was a place, a, a church to visit. It was a standout church. They had a name. They had a great reputation but they were dead. And it says, uh, uh, Jesus says, of course, uh, but you're dead. It was all false. This church was popular, but it was powerless. This church had everything going on. It was a fun, exciting place, but there was, it was dead spiritually. It had nothing spiritually going on. And uh, I think of 2 Timothy 3, 5, where it says, and having a form of godliness, it looked good. There was a form there, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. And this church had decayed on the inside. And this church had become dead on the inside. This is your, uh, dead, your dead church. And it's just, it, it looks great on the outside, but there's nothing going on. There's nothing spiritual. The Holy Spirit is not working. God is not moving in this church. And this was a church that... Um, no doubt uh, tolerated uh, those who wished to turn it from Scripture. It was uh, more concerned about being popular than maybe saying something that might offend someone. They didn't want to say something that could offend an important or powerful person in the church or community. So this was a church that more than likely uh, was careful with their message. Maybe we don't want to say anything controversial to get the, get the politician, get the city, get this guy who so mad at us. Uh, they were more interested in external things, uh, things to be known and popular for, than in spiritual things. And they'd become a very a sociable, very exciting place to be, for, uh, but they weren't a place for promoting the gospel. They were satisfied with their present condition, and they weren't looking to, uh, to critique themselves. They weren't looking to uh, look, uh, look inward and maybe figure out if they were the problem. No, they were satisfied. They were happy with where they are. And they sure had a lively name, but they were a dead church. And what a sad place to be, a church that has so much going on, so much exciting in Sardis. And it was known, known around, by, but had a, a living a name that it lived. People knew this church, uh, but it was dead. And in verse 2 of chapter 3, uh, Jesus says, Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. And this uh, word, uh, be watchful, it literally means wake up. And God was telling this church, hey guys, 
wake up, you're asleep. I would like focus on people, wake up, be watchful. And uh, uh, this church didn't, uh, re- this, the church thought everything was great, but due to their lack of awareness, they didn't realize how close to collapse they really were. And uh, we see this constantly in our society. Uh, boy, the economy's in bad shape, uh, but it doesn't matter. Man, people just uh, vote for the crazy party that's causing it anyway. It's like, why are people like this? Don't they know this is a problem? You know, they're, they're not awake. And we see this, uh, babies are being killed by the thousands, but that's not a concern. We need our rights. You know, it's so great. I'm like, what? I'm like wake up. Don't you see what's going on? Uh, we see this, uh, the, the, the fundamental building blocks of family and society are being destroyed, and so many are destroyed even phased by it it's not who cares and you're like man we just want to grab these people and say wake up don't you see what's going on there is death occurring here and you think it's alive you think everything is great but it's not it's it is just it blows your mind and then uh and you just want to wake people up but sadly this can easily happen in our lives as well it can be easy to get to the point where you know what i haven't read my bible for a while but man i have a fun activity planned for this weekend it's like oh you're missing the important thing uh, we get to the point where I haven't spent, uh, I have, uh, haven't spent a more than a passing moment of time in prayer for ages, but the bank account's doing really good, so everything must be fine. It's like, oh, no, no, you're missing out the, the most important part. you got death coming. Uh, I haven't witnessed or passed out of track in years, but uh, my team did great last weekend, so, man, everything's okay. And how easy it is for any of us to get so focused on ourselves and taking care of ourselves and promoting our needs and our concerns that we fall asleep on the things that truly matter. And we see here a church that was asleep. Man, they had a lot of good stuff going on, but they forgot to watch the most important stuff. And this church was dying. Of course, the devil, he always strikes when we're not watching. Uh, 1 Peter 5, 8 tells us to be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And the devil is looking for people who are asleep, who aren't watching, uh, who are just letting the important things die. And those are the people he comes, he attacks, he devours. And this was a city that knew very well the importance of watching. They had learned it in their history. Uh, the, the mythology goes, this isn't true, this is a myth, okay? It's a cool story, though, uh, that the guy named Miles, who uh, supposedly founded the city of Sardis thousands of years ago, uh, that he was given a power to make the fortress of this city impenetrable to attack. This was going to be uh, de- indefeatable, indestructible. And the only thing he had to do, uh, kind of a weird thing, but the only thing in this myth that he had to do was carry a lion all the way around the walls, and the place would never be defeated. And I don't know why you don't want to carry your lion around, but anyway, that's how the myth goes. And so he did. He starts carrying this lion all the way around the walls, and he gets to the south side of the city, and he sees the wall. There is an extremely steep slope up this mountain, and he doesn't want to carry this, this lion up this mountain. That's a lot of work. I wouldn't want to carry a lion up a mountain. But he doesn't want to carry this lion up a mountain, so he decides, you know what, this is so steep, no one's going to attack up here. No one's going to get up here anyway, so he skipped that part of the mountain, and he walked around everywhere else. And uh, sure enough, uh, as a... Um, a fate, of course, would have it when it was attacked. The city was attacked by the Persians. Uh, the Persians, of course, laid siege to the city of Sardis and King, great King Cyrus. And they're laying siege. Of course, they have very, very unsuccessful. So they uh, camp down for a siege. And one of the troops one night uh, notices a little trail going up this side of the mountain and uh, doesn't really notice anybody on top. And he sneaks up there and he finds no one watching this side of the mountain uh, because, of course, it's too steep. It's impenetrable. Who would come up this way? And so the Persians, a bunch of them, snuck up that night and they overthrew the city. And I uh, conquered it because this city wasn't being watchful. And just a couple hundred years later, the same thing happened. Uh, Antiochus III and his Syrians, of course, one of uh, Alexander the Great's uh, generals, one of the descendants of them, uh, came and attacked this city. And he attacked it head-on, of course, fails because it's up on a mountain. The defenses are great. And as his troops are camped around, they begin to notice uh, this part of the wall up on this really steep side. A bunch of birds just kind of hanging out and, you know, coming and going and doing whatever, and they assume, you know, if there's birds hanging out up there, there's probably no guards standing watch, because if there was guards there, the birds wouldn't be there. And so they sneak up there that night, sure enough, there's nobody there, and they conquer the city. They take it again, and Sardis gets overthrown. And uh, I'm sure these people are very aware when God says, well, be watchful, wake up, pay attention, uh, that this uh, church realizes danger of being asleep in this community would realize the significance of that and as christians we should be aware of the consequences of not being watchful 
Uh, Matthew 26, 41 says, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, uh, but the flesh is weak. And whenever we are off watch, we lose ground. And this church had stopped being watchful. They'd fall asleep, and as a result, they were dying. Uh, dying on the inside, dying spiritually. He says uh, in the verse, uh, Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die for I have not found thy works perfect before God. And God called them to be watchful and to strengthen those things that remain. It wasn't a time to lower the standards. It was time to strengthen them. It wasn't time to go uh, soft on sin. It was time to strengthen that. It wasn't time to stop witnessing. It was time to strengthen their witness. It wasn't time to quit living a godly life. It was time to strengthen their godly living. It wasn't time to neglect prayer time and skip out on the Bible reading time. It was time to strengthen those things. And God says, be watchful and strengthen those things that remain, that are ready to die. These things were dwindling, these important things. And then verse 3, Jesus says, remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and how and hold fast and repent. If thou shalt not watch, I will come as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come. He tells him here, Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard. And of course, this church had received a lot. They'd received many good things from God, they'd received many blessings. And uh, they had gotten to the point where it was theirs, and they were using it for their benefit, for their enjoyment. But, of course, everything is not for us. It's from God. James 1.17 tells us every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights. And this church was losing or letting waste the things that God had given them. And uh, God had blessed them so much, but instead of using it for God's glory and God's benefit, uh, they became watchful. They, became, uh, they, came, they stopped watching. They, they let things die, and they just used those things to make a name for themselves. And I think of the parable that Jesus told in Luke 19, as this wealthy man was going on a long journey to inherit a kingdom. He left his servants with a, a, each a talent. And of course, one of them took the talent and was diligent and turned it into ten talents. The other one took one and turned it into five, but the one hid it in a napkin. And of course, when the, the man came back with the kingdom he'd inherited, he was very displeased with that servant, and he took it away from him and gave it with the guy with ten. But here we see this church not only didn't use what God's given them, it says here they use these things to make a name for themselves. They use these things for their own enjoyment, for their own benefit, to make themselves known, to promote themselves. And God was not pleased. He says, boy, if you don't get this straightened out, I'm going to come as a thief one day. I'm going to take it away. It's going to be gone. And this church, instead of uh, uh, realizing that what they had really belonged to God, he was the one who possessed it. it all, he owned it all. He, he, it all belonged to him. They'd used it for, them, for themselves and used it to make a name for themselves. And uh, last page here. And uh, this church... Uh, Here we go. God does not give us talent and ability and resources to build up and benefit our name and prestige and position. Uh, They are for his. And this church, while they had a great name, they were well known in the area and the region. A name that they lived. Boy, this was an exciting place to be. Uh, They were dead. And they'd use that to use what God had given them for the wrong things. And then verse 4, it says, Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. And we see here a faithful few in this city. And uh, while most of this church had drifted the wrong direction, there were still a faithful few in Sardis. And uh, Christ never misses someone who stands faithful for him, no matter how small it may seem. And I'm sure these people were uh, pretty discouraged in this church, but yet God, was, God saw it and God recognized it. I think of the widow and her might, as all these rich men are coming in and throwing money in the plate, and Jesus and his disciples are watching, and I'm sure the disciples are like, oh man, that guy put in a lot of gold. I mean, that's how we'd all be. That's impressive. And some little lady throws in a couple pennies. It's like, who cares? But Jesus is like, stop, stop, stop. That lady just put in the most. And God notices our faithfulness. God notices when we uh, stand for him, when we live our lives for him. He noticed the faithful few, the few names in Sardis that had not defiled their garments. And uh, while, uh, many, uh, while these few may not have fit in or stood out as anything special with the church of Sardis anymore, they stood out for Christ. And in verse 5, we see here uh, the conclusion of this letter. He says, He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. That's pretty cool. See, this church, they were known and they were talked about in Sardis. 
They, they, this was church had the name that was known in the community. They had a name that was known in, in uh, the region, the other churches of Asia. They probably thought, ooh, Sardis, that's a cool place. That's a fun church to visit when you're traveling through town. Uh, but in heaven, they weren't known. God says, though, if you overcome this, and instead you, you focus on, on, on me and on my work instead of making a name for yourselves, he says here that uh, I'll confess your name before my Father and before his angels. And uh, it's, it's so much more important. This world wants us to strive to promote ourselves and to make a name for ourselves. This church had done. But more important than being known in this earth is being known in heaven, is being spoken of well in heaven. And boy, I'd rather have uh, God and the angels speaking well of me, as this says, than any other church across town or any other uh, community or uh, some other uh, friend or neighbor. While those things are important, we don't want to have a bad reputation. Our goal is always, always to lift up Christ and to lift up his name. And uh, the reward here of standing faithful. And if you overcome this, you'll be known and talked about in heaven. And, of course, Revelation 3, 6, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And God says, boy, churches, wake up, listen, pay attention to this. This is for everybody, for all the churches. And uh, the church in Sardis had been given a lot by Jesus Christ. And the possessing one, the one who it all belonged to. But instead of using it to lift him up, they used it to make a name for themselves. While all those around thought it was the liveliest place in town, it probably had the best of everything. The community loved it. Its potluck was probably incomparable. But Christ looked at it and thought one thing. It's dead. What are you using what God has given you for? For your benefit, your prestige, your comfort, your enjoyment, or to lift him up? And God calls us all in this passage to be watchful. Wake up. Boy, make sure you're, you're taking care of the, the important things. Make sure you strengthen those good things that remain that are ready to die. And make sure your, your focus is on the right thing. Remember, it all belongs to him. We are in his service. We're in his work. And it's not about us. And we see these letters to these two churches. Well, they are uh, some kind of some sterner letters and uh, compared to some of the other ones we've talked about. Uh, they are so for us, and it's so easy in this world to get pulled away, pulled away by impurity uh, and uh, by uh, this, uh, the wickedness of idolatry and immorality in the world all around us. Boy, we need to keep ourselves unspotted, keep ourselves away from that stuff. And it's, it can be so easy to, uh, to fall asleep, just to get in our zone, to get in our comfort, and uh, to think, boy, we have all these good things for us and for us to enjoy. While we can enjoy them, they're not for us to enjoy. They're for us to use for him, for his honor and glory, to promote the gospel and to get it out, to let his light shine to other people. And so we'll finish up right there and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today. I thank you for these uh, letters and uh, the book of Revelation to these seven churches and uh, uh, so much we can learn from them and uh, help us all to apply these to our lives. And uh, thank you so much for blessing us and for uh, giving us the church and giving us your word. And you give us so much and it all belongs to you. Help us never forget that. And help us always to uh, keep an eye out for uh, purity and never let impurity and immorality and idolatry creep in our lives like the uh, church of Thyatira did. But that we would, be, we would be watchful, we'd be sober and vigilant. And uh, keep us all safe this week. Uh, give us all a good uh, remainder of the evening here tonight. We sure do love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Choir practice.